Welcome back to another episode of I Wish They Knew, a show where we share big ideas that deserve more attention in about the time it takes to enjoy a cup of coffee. I'm Joe Hirsch. Today's wish comes from Jordan Montgomery. Jordan is a performance coach and keynote speaker and the owner of Montgomery Companies, a business consulting firm that works with executives, sales organizations, and entrepreneurs. Jordan has led high-performing sales teams in the financial services industry, and he's the author of a great book, just finished it, The Art of Encouragement, How to Lead Teams, Spread Love, and Serve from the Heart. Jordan, welcome to the show. Joe, thanks so much for having me, man. I I love your energy, and I also love that you showed up prepared. Uh, A mentor of mine, John Maxwell, says that the way that you prepare shows how much you care. So thank you for having me, and thanks for showing up with a, a great level of care today. Thank you. So what do you wish more people knew? I I wish people knew how much it meant at the end of the day when you truly, genuinely, unauthentically encourage the heart of another person. So some people are natural encouragers, others are not. And in the book, you outline 10 arts of encouragement that really anyone can apply to improve their encouragement craft. Why is this so important and something that we should be paying more attention to? Give you three reasons. Number one is it speaks to the most basic human need, socially and psychologically, that we all have, which is the need to feel known. So all of us want to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. We desire to be known, to be connected, to be valued, to be seen, and to be understood. We all desire that. Number two, we often overestimate our ability to make people feel that way. And there's some research and data that accompanies that claim. I have, I know in my own journey, overestimated my ability to make people feel that way with my kids, with my friends, certainly in the workplace. And then number three is I think oftentimes we reduce encouragement to something we do or don't do. And the reality is it's more of an art form and it deserves to get that type of attention. So there's a lot of nuance. If you get around somebody who's really, really great at encouraging other people, there's a ton of nuance that goes into how they operate, connect, and interact with the world around them. So we wanted to write a book that would help leaders spread love, serve from the heart, and empower teams. And it really is a choice, something that anyone can do. Yeah, that's the good news, Joe, right? It's like everyone knows how to do this. And we've often said that encouragement isn't so much a style, it's a choice. And there's certainly people who are listening who are like, oh, encouragement isn't for me, or that's not my style. Uh, I just challenge that mindset. If if you had to, you would. And if someone was maybe living their darkest day or you knew you weren't going to see that person again for whatever reason, I bet you'd find it in you to encourage them in some of the ways that we're about to talk about. So you talk about this, this character encouragement in the book. What happens when we flip that frame and we start praising people for their character and not just their achievements? Well, I think if we go back to our most meaningful conversations, like go back to childhood. You know, and think about the mentors or the teachers or the maybe as a neighbor, somebody pulled you aside and, and they really sort of spoke life. They cast vision for your future. That there's a, a conversation that you remember, and maybe you don't even remember everything that they did, but you certainly remember the way that it made you feel. My guess is though those conversations had far more to do with who you are than what you do. And I think our society today has a due problem. I'll tell just a real brief story. It's actually not in the book, but one that happened more recently. My daughter um, tried out for basketball and she's a a seventh grader who's really a dancer, but wanted to try basketball. And so she comes home and says, mom and dad, I'd love to try basketball. And I'm thinking, you're a dancer. We don't have time for basketball. She does dance year round. But really, uh, my insecurity as a dad was, you don't know what you're doing in basketball and you're going to look silly. And I should have been supporting the fact that she wanted to try something new, Joe, but instead I had this sort of critical spirit that was afraid that she wasn't going to perform as well as maybe she should or could. So two weeks later, basketball season rolls around, right? She goes to two weeks worth of practice and they have their first game. She's on the C team, seventh grade girls basketball. This isn't like the, the, you know, this isn't the Olympic, you know, basketball team. I'll say it like that. It's not the Hawkeyes. By by the way, it's not the Hawkeyes. That's right. Come on. Not the Hawkeyes. Certainly not the Penn State and the Lions. Uh, To be clear, my daughter is athletic. She is an amazing kid. Third quarter rolls around. My daughter's in the game. She shoots her first free throw. And um, Joe, she misses everything. The the rim, the backboard, like it just doesn't go well for Audrey. And she's standing out there on the free throw line. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like this is embarrassing. I'm like secondhand embarrassed. Like it just, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great moment, you know? And so I'm starting to prepare my speech for that night. Like, okay, we're going to talk her out of basketball. Let's get back to dance. 
she jumps in the car with me and um after the game, maybe thirty minutes later, and uh I think they win like, you know, eight to four or something. It's you know, one of those one of those kind of doozies. Like a and, baseball uh, game. <laughs> yeah, like a baseball game. Yeah. And and I and I looked at my daughter and I said, Well, sis, you know, what'd you think? Your first basketball game, what'd you think? And she said, uh, you know, Dad, I am not very good at basketball. And I remember thinking, you know, we we could tell that. Um you just haven't done it a lot, right? But her follow-up statement was, um, but you know, I loved it. I loved it. I had, I had such a good time. And in a moment, I felt so convicted, Joe, because as her dad, as, as the person in her life who's supposed to be really one of the greatest encouragers, I was so caught up in what she was doing instead of being caught up in who she is. And if I was really caught up in who she is, what I would have done is I would have praised her for stepping out in faith and doing something that she's not really experienced at, taking a chance, being brave enough to suck at something new like adults need to, I need to learn from her example. And so I realized how often I fall short with my kids, with my friends in the workplace. I over-prioritize the do and I under-prioritize the who. Mm. And unfortunately, the who always means more than the do. So the message is, Joe, I think we got to get back to praising people for their gifts, their traits, the person they were made to be, instead of focusing on the box score, the result, or the productivity. Yeah, we know that praise is most effective when it focuses on process and effort, not just performance and yes. outcomes. And shifting that is a huge way to make someone really feel seen and heard. Yeah, well said, because you're really, you're really affirming who they are, not something they've done. But, and we see this a lot in the athlete space. You know, you're a big sports guy. Athletes have a really difficult time with this because someone falls in love with them based on what they do, yeah. but they don't know anything about who they are. So when they hang it up in football or basketball, we're fortunate to work with a lot of athletes. There's a, there's a lot of identity issues because man, I, the whole world knows me and has praised me for what I do, but they don't really know who I am. And so you want to, encourage somebody for their identity and who they were made to be. It just means more, always will, always has. And one of the ways to do that doesn't require these grand gestures. It can just be simple things that actually elevate others. What are some of the ways that we might do that specifically in the workplace to lift people up without these dramatic gestures, but just simple things that make a difference for them? You just make it your mission to point out the good in the people around you. Even if there's not a lot of good, like that's the point, right? But there's, there's some good in everybody, right? So John Maxwell taught me this, like I want to put, I want to put a 10 on people's forehead. Here's the deal. They might not be a 10 today, but I want them to see that they could be a 10. They've got gifts and abilities. There's, there's qualities that I want them to be more in tune with. And so what I want to do is when I have the proverbial microphone, Joe, is I want to shout them out. I want to give them public praise. I don't want to overdo it to the point where it's awkward, but I want to let them know I notice and you matter. I notice you matter and I want other people to know that too. So let's get practical. It doesn't take um, a whole lot of talent or ability. It does take a little bit of energy and effort. Social media is a great tool and don't get on it to uh, broadcast yourself. Get on it to broadcast others. If you broadcast yourself, you don't have a brand, you have a brochure. You know, build a brand, be somebody who supports and elevates others on social media. Um, I've got a client, Joe, uh, so he's a financial advisor and a farmer. That's actually possible in the great state of Iowa. Okay. It's like the more pigs you have, the better, you know, more people are impressed with your financial planning business. And, uh, but, but he's very, very successful. This guy's very successful, not really on social media. I said to him, I said, Mitch, I want you to share about an important relationship in your life and post it on social media. Doesn't want to do it, right? I didn't think he was going to do it. Um, calls me the next day, four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, Jordan, by golly, is what he said. By golly. You know, he's a, he's a farmer in Iowa. You know, I, I took your advice and I, I just posted about two restaurant tours. They own several restaurants in our town. And they've been successful, but they really provided, you know, so many experiences for my family and I over the years. We got to know them really well and Joe and Julie. And so I just posted a picture with me and them. And it was like three sentences like, I love Joe and Julie. They have great restaurants. If you've ever eaten at one of their restaurants, comment below about your experience. He's like, Jordan, this is insane. He's like, there's like hundreds of likes. And Jordan, there's 111 comments 24 hours later. But here's the best part. The best part is Joe picked up the phone to call me and said, hey, I don't know where that came from or why you posted that, but I just want you to know that meant a lot to me and Julie. What Mitch did is he had created an experience where he elevated them and gave a whole bunch of other people the opportunity to share in praising Joe and Julie. 
If you praise someone in private, they might remember it. If you praise them in public, they'll never forget it. Mm, yeah, that's really true. So let's turn to the dark side of praise and the dark side of encouragement. And that's the inauthenticity that sometimes finds its way into these conversations. How can we be careful to protect against that while still being intentional about calling out the great things about other people? People know when we're being authentic and inauthentic. You and I have been on this conversation, I don't know, better part of 15 minutes or whatever, right? Um, we're getting to know each other. But you you know, because you're a pretty intuitive guy and you spend time with people, if I'm being authentic or inauthentic. Now, you might not know the full picture, but you get a sense for this person. You know, Jordan is being real with me or or he's really not. And so here's the deal. When we are authentic, we're most effective. And when we're inauthentic, we are the least effective that we'll ever be. So how do you know? Because subconsciously, it's like, well, we kind of can pick up on it. But how do we make sure that people know we're being authentic in our praise? I think it really gets down to specificity. It gets down to being um, specific about the why behind the what. So I can say to Joe, Joe, you're a great podcaster. And you've probably been told that many times before. And I bet most of the time when people say that to you, they sort of just leave it at that. It's like, dude, I really enjoyed your show, Joe. Like, you, you got a great podcast. But here's how you know that I mean it. I said, Joe, you're a, you're a really great podcaster, man. Um, you showed up really prepared today. Like, I, I was really interested and amazed by all that you knew about me, even though this is really our first time connecting. Like, you clearly had read the book. You knew about the book. You knew about my life. You knew about my background. You know that I love the Hawkeyes. Like, Man, a mentor of mine, John Maxwell, said the way that you prepare shows how, how much you care. Thank you, man, for showing up prepared and caring enough about this conversation to make it count. Like, you clearly have a really great gift of leading conversations, which is why you've got this amazing podcast. So, man, just want to encourage you to keep up the great work with the podcast. It's like writing a thank you note to somebody and just saying, hey, thanks for the gift versus really getting specific about the reasons why you appreciate it and the difference it made. Yeah. And it's such a simple thing. Like all of this, the entire book is simple. I think encouragement by itself is relatively simple, but it is nuanced and it does take a little bit of energy and effort. And so I think that's the point. What if someone's in a job and he or she doesn't receive this kind of encouragement from the people around them? Do you have any tips on how we might encourage ourselves? Um, there's a the art of self encouragement. Um, we all deal with negative thoughts. You know, the statistics vary, but it's like 75,000 thoughts a day. 80% of them are negative. We're not always in control of what we think, but we are in control of what we say. Ironically, what I say drives a lot of how I think. And so if I can get really good at not listening to myself, but speaking to myself, I'm going to be a more positive, more abundant, more encouraging person to be around for others, but also for myself. So the tip there would be, Pay really close attention to the words that come out of your mouth. Externalization is a real thing when it comes to performance, mindset, and improvement. And what we say drives a lot of how we think. The good news is we are 100% in control of the words that we use and what we say. Yeah, so speak your way into these intentions. I think it's a good reminder that if you want to be a more uh, positive, abundant person and feel better about yourself, you have to be your best encourager. Yeah. The information here is so powerful, so practical, and yet something that we just need to pay more attention to. The book is The Art of Encouragement, and the author, and I feel encouraged by this conversation, is Jordan Montgomery. Jordan, thanks for sharing your wish with us today. Joe, thanks for having me, man. Truly enjoyed uh, the conversation, and you are truly good at what you do, and um, I really am glad we were able to connect. Thanks for having me.